Welcome to the future. Get ready to explore how spirituality and science will come together in the age of Aquarius. Hosted by JC Nova. Today on the show, we have futurist Lisa Lotte Lingso, a founding partner and future navigator. She's likely to be one of the most inspiring and enthusiastic persons you will ever meet. She extensively works with scenarios for the future, innovation, technologies, and megatrends that have consequences for the way we think, work, feel, and travel. Join us for a conversation on what the future holds in the age of Aquarius. Now, on with the show. Welcome to the future. This is Age of Aquarius, and I am JC Nova. I'm here today with Lisa Lingso. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for allowing me into the show. It's very exciting to be here. Yes, I am fascinated with the Age of Aquarius, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you today about the future. How did you first become involved in Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies? Well, I had a bit of a detour amongst, I actually started it in, in the UK at Oxford, and then that brought me to the European Commission, where we were doing scenarios for Europe 2010, all the way back in 96. And I'm very proud to say that already in 96, we predicted Brexit in one of the scenarios, and finally it's happening. Being a futurist is not like looking into a crystal ball. It's very much like looking at some of the tracks in the present and then trying to imagine, so how are they going to unfold in the future? So it's, it's half science, social science, if you like, and half art. And it's in that intersection that, that we look for, for the future. What inspired you to start Future Navigator and what does Future Navigator do? Future Navigator is very much, it's democratizing the future. It's making the future yours. So, so if you are hosting a show, you might be thinking about, will a robot take over, you know, my hosting? I can have this uh, artificial person. And then you experiment with that and you think, but they're not very good to show sentiments. They do not really know how to be spontaneous. So it's probably going to take a while. So, so I think that's what Future Navigator does. It's just, it's not just looking at the top 10 megatrends, but really trying to find out what areas is going to transform your life. So, so it's taking it one step down, if you like, uh, rather than these overriding what have the tendency to become buzzwords rather than something meaningful to people. And I think the whole point is not, you know, leaning back and then being right about the future. The whole point is warning. So when we talked about Brexit back in 96, it was really saying, well, we should really do something about creating a European identity now. Otherwise, we risk missing the bits because they are really in it for the money and they should be in it for something more than that. What are some of the other projects that you've worked on or you're currently working on that you're most excited about? I love future studies. I've been only been working with exciting projects. So I've been working with a really interesting uh, project for IKEA. And that was uh, fun because we were basically uh, spotting future trends in, st in different households. And then after a few days, I was talking about, as I'm Scandinavian, I was talking about the wolf hour at five o'clock because everybody were tired and howling. And we call that the wolf hour. Then there were a lot of English speaking people there and they said, oh, but we call it the tea time. You know, that's when mother is bringing out the cookies. And I'm like, oh, no, that's not happening anymore. And mom is at the labor market and she's just got back and so have the kids from daycare and the blood sugar is incredibly low and everybody's screaming. And so understanding that this was even an issue became a whole future product line. So that was cool. I just had really exciting session with people who are making maps, you know, Google, like Google Maps, but mapping out the future and the future of that. What I really like there, and I think you find that interesting talking about the Aquarius era we're moving into now is that I was talking in uh, about how important it is to make these maps in terms of creating sustainability, because if we can really compare each other and if we can really see 
where the CO2 footprints are going, then it's actually possible to intervene. And they said, it's so funny that you're saying so, because the whole mapping industry arise from the military business, you know. So our whole measure system is how can a soldier hide between a little hill with a backpack on his shoulder? And we really have to create some closure as well in order to open up for, for this new society. And, and I said, but you've never been more important, guys. But so, so sometimes people have to have their future translated into them. And then they say, oh, now I see why it's so important that I go to work every day. How does futurism affect society? Well, not enough, if you ask me. I think there are too many people who are extremely responsive and think that, you know, they hear all kinds of stuff in the media and they say it's it's so chaotic, so I better just, you know, stay on my diet and <laughs> look at tomorrow. But I think future studies should affect society a lot more because this is really how you can empower people to, uh, first of all, navigate and look into what is happening and then translate that into new competences, new action points themselves. And I think uh, sometimes we seem extremely victimized today and which I think is crazy because we've never had so many interesting technologies at our disposal. So all we have to do is really make our mind up in terms of what do we want to create, you know, the distance from envisioning something to actually being able to do it has never been shorter. So, you know, I thank God that I'm not, you know, born a hundred years ago where I couldn't even vote and I had to stay home and do the laundry with my hands, you know, so being a woman, I'm very thankful that we are now in this new situation. And it's like, I think when the mobile phone just came out, everybody kept going into a phone booth in order to make their calls. And it took them a while before they realized, hey, I'm free. I can actually go anywhere to do my calls now. And likewise, I think it hasn't really dawned on us how empowered we are as humans to actually create the society that we want to create. What does the word human 2.0 mean to you? It's a kind of an upgrade from something to something else. And I don't really like these uh, technology metaphors because for me, I see the technological development as a way that we can rehumanize people again. So for a long time, we had to work like machines because machines were really, really bad at being machines. So we had to do that job. And now, finally, they are starting to figure out how to do that part. And now we can really start using our intuition again, our sentiments, our sense of laziness, of our curiosity, our love to one another. So I think that's quite uh, fantastic that we are being given back that space because the industrial society has really been quite hard on people. And planets. So most of us spend a lot of time online to do our work and social media is a big part of our daily life. And you'll always see in the news people talking about, especially for Instagram, people crafting their persona for social media, the way they look and taking photos. Do you think in the future that we're going to be more concerned about our persona and more materialistic or less or, or a combination of both? Yeah. I think if you call that materialistic, I don't know. I think we are always concerned about competition and status. That said, I think we are moving into a society where online and offline are melding together. We see this whole gamer generation and they have avatars. And then we will have this whole palais of, you know, I could sit here as a cow or as a dragon or whatever you like me to be. I think the actual look is not going to be as interesting as the story that I want to convey to you. So I think status is going to be far more around the storytelling of the human being rather than some standard. If you see Miss Universe today, you can't even see whether they are from China, India, Ireland or wherever. They are all having this extremely standardized look which is extremely boring. And the counter trend to this is, uh, you know, the storytelling where people are, are really expressing their culture, their belief, 
and they are, will experiment a lot more because it's possible. Do you think we'll continue to become more tribal? For me personally, I have people that I work with on a daily basis that are all over the world that I've never met in person that I consider very good friends. And then, of course, I have my friends and family that I see physically. And I'm just curious, do you see people continuing to be more tribal based on their interests? Or I'm just curious what you think about that. I think it it will go both ways. So as we work more and more hybrid and more and more online, we will actually make sure that we create villages. It takes a village to raise a child together with neighbors who are contributing with uh, other parts to our world, you know. So we don't know what we don't know we can't live without. And that's a problem with the Elon Musk Neuralink or whatever, or when you Google or when you go on the social media or when you find your tribal friends, you actually have to look for it. You have to know what do I not know. And I, the, the tricky part is uh, the stuff you didn't know you should have asked for. And that is really something you need to have in a position of listening louder in your physical village around you. So I think people will become much more focused on placing themselves physically along with some people in some neighborhoods. We're moving from, from you know, we had the, the, the agricultural society, then we had the industrial society, then we have had the information society. In the future, we're going to have the precision society. And that means that we can't afford, in terms of sustainability, in terms of our life, to have all kinds of rubbish and products lying around. And that's how we become less materialistic, if you like, can't have a car standing there for 90% of the time that we're not use, using in some car parking place. Or we can't have all these leftover foods that nobody is eating. You know, we can't have the same medication for everybody. We need the specific one that you need, that I need. So, so in the precision economy, it's very important that you place yourself the same with the energy, by the way, the power of X, that you place yourself together with some other people who have the stuff that you need. So it's almost like this Tetris game where you have to put all the pieces together in order to create the whole. So that's going to be one part. And so so we'll be uh, very present in our local hood. And at the same time, we'll have all these tribal satellites. We will need to, to, to plug into this global brain of inspiration, information, real-time data. So, so we have a physical person and then we'll have a digital twin uh, so your digital twin jay will go all around the globe and will be part of many tribes and will be able to engage almost as closely as in your neighborhood but based on different values and i think again when people realize that hopefully they will become even more curious at leaving their filter bubble, finding out it's not that dangerous. But I guess that would be on the future curriculum of schools to actually being able to do that. What about the metaverse? I don't know about in Scandinavia, but here in the United States, that's a big conversation with Facebook's recent announcement. I think the metaverse is the way it's conveyed by metaverse right now. Uh, people are sitting around a table again. Is completely crazy. Why should we be sitting around a table again when we're already sitting ourselves to death now? But I think the whole gaming metaphor and being in virtual reality, that is definitely going to be coming. And what we know is within uh, five years, I can lick on my phone and taste anything. So you can electronically create any taste, any smell that you like. So we will have that. We will have holograms that we can hug and that we can feel and that we can sense. We won't be meeting, that's for sure, in some two-dimensional version like this one where we can't even have an eye contact. And, and these things are developing extremely fast because uh, there are so many people and businesses around the world who are struggling to fix this. So that is definitely a, a development that we are seeing. People are sometimes getting a little worried about, oh, then will we uh, meet each other? But one thing that has come out of this uh, lockdown has been these virtual water cooler meetings where business have said, oh, now the colleagues can't see each other. So, you know, HR is putting together 
all people in groups of two in the whole organization and they have to drink a virtual water during half an hour. And suddenly, you know, they meet other people because it's an illusion that we meet new people every day. People go to work and they speak with the same five people that they like, that think about life the same way as they do. And they sit together in the cantina. So uh, sometimes it's actually good to have a bit of a crisis, breaking up habits a little bit. So who do you think will control the digital future? People raise concerns that Facebook, Google, Amazon, they have too much power. And obviously we have our physical government that runs countries or states. But at the same time, if you look at someone like Mark Zuckerberg, he has a lot of power and a lot of control over how we think and feel. And how do you see that evolving in the future? Okay, so remind me to do a medium-term answer and and a long-term. Medium-term, we have three different routes. So we have the American, which is very much based on commercial interest. You're sharing your data, you're sharing your privacy, and they become richer and richer on your attention and your time. Then we have something really interesting going on in China at the moment. So what we're doing with all these data, data collection combined with artificial intelligence, combined with these massive calculation powers that are developing, is that we are being able to create some kind of well-being budget. I was talking about before about these digital twins. So basically, I'll be able to look at your patterns and I can say, okay, the way you speak to your husband, you will be divorced within two months, or you're about to develop a depression, or you're lying right now. I can see that on your mimicry. So what they have used that for in China, for instance, is that they have measured people going to work in the morning saying, okay, they're spending far much time on gaming and binging bad series, basically. So they come to work with the equivalent of hangovers every day. And then what they did in certain housing areas was that they closed down the internet between 10 and 7 in the morning and then measure people again saying, oh, they come to work now and they are all fresh and happy and they're even having kids again, you know. And now they have decided that kids should only play video games for one hour between 8 and 9 p.m. a a day. One hour. It's a huge step if you think about it. So that's your, the state is controlling you. You're one with no democracy, a dictator saying this is how it should be, using artificial intelligence, using data to decide. Then you have the American way. Then in South Korea, you have uh, the fifth most popular career is actually being an e-sport player. They're practicing gaming 16 hours a day, these young kids. So now you can see you suddenly have two different scenarios. In one country, they grow up, you know, gaming, gaming, gaming. In China, they have then decided, now we put a cap on that. And then we have uh, another route, which is a European route, where we have GDPR, general data protection, and all these privacy issues uh, where we are protecting the individual, but we are still trying to collect data and finding out. And here it's really the government's deciding, and they're coming after uh, Google and Facebook at the moment, and they're trying to tax them, they are trying to threaten them to to change their way. So, So in that sense, there's a battle going on. But On the long term, I promise you to talk about the long term. I actually think we will have a decentralization of this knowledge. So right now it's a central office of China who knows how these uh, data and how these digital twins are faring and can decide, you know, what to turn up for and what to turn up down for. But imagine that you are a parent in the future. I actually think you will have this uh, digitalized knowledge on your hand. So your kid will say, oh, can I have a candy night? And then the avatar of your child will say, oh, please don't give her too much candy. You know, it will ruin her teeth. And, you know, she will get all sugar energetic and you won't get her to sleep at 10 o'clock as you're planning to. So you have this decentralized advice in how to think about environmentally and how where to spend your resources in terms of investing your money in terms of investing your time in terms of what should you be learning you can imagine that we are all in some kind of simulation game where we are more or less putting up the rules ourselves and designing our society of course taking care of, of the other people who are there 
but but very much uh, allowing the individual to be knowledgeable about these things as opposed to so so the whole uh, headquarter thinking is really outdated and it fitted really well to the industrial society but again i think it's a phone booth metaphor coming back what new technology that's coming out do you think will have the most impact on society moving forward is it artificial intelligence I mean, no doubt this metaverse is going to take a lot of room because we have to think in terms of of creating a more sustainable society. We have a big climate crisis and we can see if we can make a a four-day work week so you can be just one day at home. That will already save you 20% of CO2. That is probably the one which most people will readily link to also in terms of uh, the gaming generation Uh, But I think the technology, which is really going to pull the carpet away from us, what I look at, I'll tell you before I give you my conclusion, because it's, it's, do you want the fish or the fishing pole, right? But what I always look for is democratization. So if it hits a lot of people, if it's empowering a lot of people, I think a lot of things will happen. And one thing that we are having now with the GPT-3 is that um, they're working on that people, anyone can be able to program anything by just talking to the machine what they want it to program. And that is mind blowing because then you can, you don't have to wait for these software people to fix things. Everybody can do it. And that's when it gets really interesting because then you can get the art businesses in there. You can get the creatives in there. And then we'll just see a, a lot of things happening. That's why I'm, I'm quite interested in this thing that you can lick on the screen and you can actually taste anything. We have just been giving out these Michelin stars, which is for the best restaurants. And it's such a small elite who are able to uh, experiment with these raw materials, experiment with different foods and tastes. And we saw that with the music industry, you know, in the old days, I think a lot of people said no to the Beatles. We don't like guitar music or whatever. And then finally they got through this little needle's eye uh, and found someone who was willing to publish their music. And now we have uh, YouTubers and we find music coming from all around the world from the most unlikely sources. I think we'll see the same with food in this near future because we are seeing this democratization of taste. Suddenly any teenage kid can play around with different taste combinations. So I'm looking forward to that. That will be interesting. That'll be interesting. And we might have Tinder with taste as well. Tinder? Is that what you said? Yeah. (laughs) Wouldn't (laughs) it be nice to be able to taste your date before going out? Oh, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure if I'd want to do that. That sounds, I'm sure guys would be really into it. Uh, (laughs) So that's an interesting topic, dating and and the metaverse. Do you think with the metaverse and artificial intelligence that people will still want to continue to, obviously people always want to meet in person, but I think it, from a social perspective, if you're spending all your time online and communicating online, I, I find lots and lots of people saying dating is harder. You know, there's too many choices. There's too many opportunities that people don't form connections like they used to say 20 years ago. Do you believe that? I think it's definitely moving into a different hybrid. So we see that people, even though they're settling down finally with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they carry on dating out there. You know, they're carrying on com- communicating. And we might need to adjust our vision of relationships. You know, if you can have a non dangerous uh, intercourses in the virtual reality space, you know, your spouse might allow you to have so, you know. So so today you either you're in a relationship or you are single. And uh, we can see already now in terms of gender, there are so many gender categories coming up now. And I think in the future we'll have a lot of different relationship categories rather than these two boxes that you can go in. Either you are single or you are settled. And if you are uh, in a couple or married as I am, people, you know, they say, okay, then we know how it looks, you know. And 
I think that is definitely going to change. So in 20 years from now, they say, oh, you're a couple. So what are your rules? You know, what are you allowed to do? Uh, so, so do you go out together in this metaverse? Or, and, and, you know, what sort of creatures are you dating? And so you can imagine a whole uh, a new exploration coming up there. Again, because, uh, it, again, a, a cultural thing, it, it of course it depends on whether you can do it culturally uh because if you are suddenly then inhibited from getting a job because somebody uh, look at your digital footprint and say oh this person is crazy you know when she's uh, faring around here then we have this neuropuritanism where people are so scared of doing anything or saying anything because they might be sent out of the human village and they starve to death so so it again it depends very much at the atmosphere that we are creating, is it decentralized? Is it democratized? Are people free to organize themselves and their lives as they want? Or do we have this big brother, brother either in China or some big uh, Google or Microsoft or whatever, looking at us, giving us some kind of ratings as how valuable are we as citizens? You know, so, so it's, it, it really depends on on the format that we are creating. And that brings me back to what you are starting asking me about. Do we spend enough time with the future? No, we don't, because this is a decision that you and I and everybody has to make. How do we want to create this metaverse? What should the rules be? And how much freedom should there be for each individual? I think a great example is right now in uh, in Hong Kong, you know, you can't uh, demonstrate for democracy, then you go to jail. And in Thailand, you can't go against the Thai king, then you go to jail. And and right now, these young people, they have actually swapped enemy. So if you live in Hong Kong, you demonstrate against the king in Thailand. And if you live in Thailand, you demonstrate to get more democracy in Hong Kong. And I think it's so beautiful that you're having these battles going on right now. And it's so important that people are spacing out room for themselves to be human. How do you think artificial intelligence will affect work and education? In terms of education, if we take that first, there is so much to get because we can just look at how it is working right now. We have a huge forgetting curve. I don't know, you've probably also been sitting in some school through a one, two hour lecture and people only remember 2% after 14 days. So it's such a waste of energy. So here we will go from if and when education to just-in-time education and from these long lectures to more micro-learning where you are all the time exchanging between getting new ideas and inspiration and then applying it. I shouldn't even just telling you about licking the screen and I should then ask you, so JC, how do you think you will use that in your life? You know, So all the time you do this uh, back and forth so people are integrating the knowledge that they get. That's one thing. The other thing is this extreme tailored education so it will know exactly what motivates me. Am I good at hearing or watching? Should I be in a competition in order to really learn? Or should I be in a fantasy universe? And again, people say, you can ask people, oh, so do you cook yourself? And some people, they will open three plastic bags and they say, I mix it all together. And yes, I cook myself. And another person will go and pick up the vegetables in the garden. And in the future, of course, AI will know exactly what sort of person you are from your past behavior and your actual living. And it will completely tailor your education. It, it won't start by telling you what you should learn. It will start by asking you, and then finding out, you know, what do you know about and what don't you know about? And uh, there are already some different uh, businesses like Area 9. They are far ahead in using this. And they have reduced medical studies by one year. And the forgetting curve as well, they have reduced a lot because they start out by finding out. They start out with the questions and then they're tailoring it to you. We spend a lot of time revisiting stuff that we already know. And again, you can use the artificial intelligence to know exactly when does Liz Lotta knows what she knows and when she should move to the next page instead of spending time and time. You probably studied for some exams. And by 
the way in the future we won't have exams. The artificial intelligence will know exactly when you know what you should know in order to do whatever you have to do. So when it comes to artificial intelligence and healthcare, I think about if you're watching a futuristic uh, program, they talk about like robots that are like kind of caregivers. Because in the United States, helping the elderly is is a really big issue and having caregivers. And do you see it like within the next 20 years, we might have like robot type caregivers for elderly or just to help around the house or even like a, a robot nanny or something like that? Already now, uh, we are expecting chatbots to take up 90% of all communications by 2030. So that's huge. So basically, you prefer speaking to a chatbot rather than me because it will always agree with you. It will comfort you, it will motivate you, it will listen to you. So that's one area. Then we have the other area uh, and a lot of elderly people, they do prefer a robot toilet to wash their behind and even give them a massage rather than some uh, strange person coming into their home that they don't know and they don't feel secure about uh, wiping their behind. So so it depends on the area as well. Again, I think we are moving into this precision economy where we have to find out, so what do we value? And those are the things that we should use human interaction for. And the stuff that we don't value as much or that we want to have automated where it doesn't really mean anything to us, that is really where we would uh, like to put in uh, some machinery. Saying that it's going to be arriving much sooner, these holograms in the metaverse talking with us, rather than this robot that needs oil and which will break apart like a vacuum cleaner coming into your house, you know. They're not very practical. They're not very flexible. We have already spent a lot of years on developing robots, and they are not that sophisticated, unfortunately. And I think for a long time, we prefer a real person changing our socks as opposed to a robot. How do you think the pandemic has affected us as a society? Has it made technology evolve more quickly in your studies? What are you seeing on how it's affecting us on a consciousness level? Just curious. I've done a whole article on that and a book as well, Aftershocks and Opportunity for Post-Pandemic Future. And there are different things. So, so first of all, see if I remember everything. You're completely right. Of course, we have this huge acceleration of, of digitalization, of new ways of working. 45% of people have uh, thought about new ways of organizing their work life. So that's huge. We are moving in different patterns than before. But I think on a more um, spiritual or mental level, I think it has been helpful in that we have heard about exponentiality for a long time. You know, things are happening at a doubling race and we haven't really understood it till we saw these uh, COVID bacteria, you know, actually spreading with an exponential race. Then we thought, oh, is that what it means? Well, then I understand that, you know, we are facing these, uh, for instance, a climate crisis or a pandemic crisis and really have to do something about it now because it's no good, you know, waiting because then we have a doubling of something really bad into something that cannot be solved at all. Uh, so in that sense, I think it had has helped. Another area, in a sense where I thought I was wrong, but I might be right, I was um, expecting science to get more attention because we were in this big healthcare situation. But at the same time, there has been uh, so many bubbles and filter bubbles where people trust different things because scientists weren't able exactly to tell either uh, how are the long-term impacts of this and that and the other. So, so that has been more blurry. I know from, from a U.S. perspective, concerns have been raised about, for example, in Austria, where the non-vaccinated community is on lockdown and the vaccinated community isn't. And obviously, that's going country by country. For myself personally, I worry about people's mental health and, and how it affects us socially and will we become the haves and the have-nots. And I'm just curious, since you studied the pandemic, do you see that 
the mandates and the lockdowns continuing or might eventually go away? For sure, you very fast have this haves and have not. One area which is not going away uh, right away is uh, the who is going to be the time owners and who is going to be the time slaves. More and more people can decide where and how they want to work and when they want to work. They are the time owners. And then you have the time slaves, for instance, the nurse that has to be in a hospital at a given time, frontline staff or whatever. She will be the time slave. And there we really see that poverty is always relative. So if a larger group is becoming time owners, you know, the time slaves are really feeling left out. And you get these us and them. And we see that very clearly also in production companies. Within production, they have to come in and then you have the administration. They can go running at lunchtime and they have a dog at home and they, you know, they go online. Uh, And that creates a lot of tension amongst colleagues who used to be the best of friends, you know. And that is exactly the same pattern that we see in terms of the anti-vax and and the vaccinators saying that the picture is blurring. Uh, in the beginning, the media put it very black and white, and now we have more and more gray zones. So yes, you're getting your vaccine, but you want your child at two years old getting the vaccine, or you know. So people start to understand that there are many nuances in this. I think that is actually another interesting learning point from the COVID that we. Um, have become less globalized and more tribal, if you like. But at the same time, we have never been comparing ourselves so much with other countries. So what do they do in Austria? Why is Boris doing this in the UK? Uh, what are they doing in the States? You know, what does it mean that Biden is now getting into power rather than Trump and so forth? So so it's, it's very interesting to, um, to see the, the curiosity of citizens of what is actually going on in different countries. And I think once we start traveling again, we have been, you know, fighting the same war on the same side. And that is actually going to be a very important conversation topic. How did you go through this, you know, and and how did your government react? What was the rule of games? How much helping package did you get if you were one of the hotels which was just lying dead for two years? You know, Did you get any help or did you have to deal with it on your own? All these questions, I think, is it's extremely uh, interesting how it, it uh, makes us really sense that we are just on one planet and we are actually all connected and uh, moving a little bit against your tribal picture. So do you think with the pandemic, it will lead, obviously, each country and each state, we have our own ID. We have a driver's license or a state ID, and then we have our passports. Do you think we'll ever move towards like a global ID? I have a global ID that allows me to travel to 12 countries um, because I do this type of business or I'm traveling for tourism. I'm just curious how you see it affecting travel. And I know, at least from the U.S. perspective, people are very concerned about tracking, online tracking and having vaccine mandate apps and things like that. So I'm just curious what your perspective is. I think uh, the fact that we have been uh, forced to do this out from healthcare data it's going to stick to us for a long time and it's just going to become even more profound because, again, in the precision era that we are moving into, we need to know exactly where are people moving to in order to make sure that we have mobility as a service, that we have the food that we need and so forth. So we need this precision data so you will not be able to move around and also it will be a fantastic way to create border control uh, that you know where people are at any point in time. So if they give up their privacy, if you like, and share in their data, they might get freedom of movement in return. I think a good picture as well coming out of the pandemic is that, well, in the Nordic country, we are amongst the happiest people in the world. I think the Finnish are the happiest one uh, in 2021. And that's because we have a lot of trust. So when we allow people to work from home, we allow them to work according to the compass, you know, tell them what are the goals and then they can find out how to get there themselves. But a lot of people in a lot of countries, they don't have the trust to their employee, their coworker, and they send them home and say, okay, so when you go to work in the morning, 
you press start recording and when you stop working you say stop recording and you have this algorithm understanding exactly what has the person done all day how what sort of breaks so so in a sense even more uh, big brother and when i look ahead i can see uh, that we we might get that kind of travel idea as well so i will be tracked at any point in time so i'll be able to be and be free to go across countries and states but people will be able to find me and kick me out as well if i don't behave wow that's going to be very interesting it it leads to a lot of great conversations and conspiracy theories and if you go onto youtube you can go down the rabbit hole per se saying that you think why why are people dying in the ocean as refugees these days that's so primitive compared to that you could actually give people a bracelet on and say, well, apply for asylum. We know where you are. We will even call you when you can go to the meeting. I don't know. There are so many things that we could do much better. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we have to be hopeful that it'll, it'll move in the right direction. But at the same time, I think it's important. Information is power and, and letting and people to, know. To be very clear in, in this podcast, as a futurist, I might sound very much whether I like something or I don't like something. My job as a futurist is to to polish the windscreen with different opportunities, different scenarios, and then ask you to say, interesting, exciting, let's, let's explore this further. But it's not to say whether things are good or bad. I try to polish the window so decision makers can decide where to go with a clearer vision. Uh, so in a sense, you know, in the future, we will uh, get our hands off the driving wheels in cars, but we will need to put our hands on the driving wheels in terms of our own life and where do we want to go. And I see my job as a futurist at, at clearing the windscreen so people can look out, but not telling them where to, to drive to or to go to. Just so you don't think, you know, that I think it's great that people are monetized and we can see where they travel around the planet. It's not my idea. You know, I'm just saying some of the trends that are, are going on now. And I think it's uh, and likewise, I would never say whether uh, a vaccine is good or bad. I'm just saying that we have some struggles going on in society right now. So if you ask me as a private person, you will get my opinions as a mother of four or as a leader of, of some people in my company. But as a futurist, I really try to stay apolitical, as neutral as possible. And even if it really provokes me, like some of the actions of China's have done, uh, you know, I really force myself to say, interesting, exciting. What can I actually learn from that? Because I think it's quite interesting that they are now mothering their citizens, for instance. Another interesting aspect of the future is we have a lot of companies in the U.S. that are focused on living forever. That's that's the big conversation or anti-aging. I'm just curious from a futurist perspective, you know, you see movies talking about cyborgs or people are like half human, half robot. Where do you see technology moving 20 years from now when it comes from a aging perspective or helping people live longer? Again, in the age of precision, we will be able to detect everything from cancer. We will be able to use CRISPR, if we like to, to manipulate the genes and, and edit people like never before. And that brings me to another very important point in terms of the public mood. I've been wondering a lot that we have a young generation who's very black and white, who's like saying, now we have to uh, look at the environment and we have to go all the way and say no to certain things. And then we have the elderly population saying, oh, you know, it's not black and white. It can be very nuanced. But I actually think the next generation will be in charge of deciding, should we have this extra long life or not? Should we actually go in? and cut in the CRISPR and change the human race forever without any ability to go back. And I think actually 
A few years ago, I was uh, wondering why American young kids, they stopped having driver license because they said, as long as I have a fast internet connection, you know, I don't need to go anywhere. Why should I have a driver license? So they had a good uh, sense of what was coming. And now it's really these very uh, vogue people who are very clear in saying no. And I think that is going to be a very important competence in this future because... Actually, it's more or less limitless what we can do. I just spoke to a very rich woman who's now paying $40,000 to have her clone, her dog cloned, a little dog, so she can have the same dog again. I'm like, okay, yes, it's possible, you know. And should you have your child clone if you, God forbid, is losing it to get exactly the same version? Our physical body is one thing. You've already had uh, experimentations on mice. So uh, you have a chip into the head of a mouse, and then it goes through this maze. It takes it three weeks to find the cheese in the middle of the maze. Then you take the chip out of the head of this mouse. You put it in, in a new mouse that has never seen the maze before. It goes straight in there within five minutes. So you can actually transplant experience so i think if i was you i wouldn't you know work so much on your old body and and hope that that would look like a 25 year old again i'd rather you know just put the your your experience chip into a new fresh body that will work <laughs> it's way much better that is bringing some different content to our discussion of humanity 2.0 uh, what versions are we going into there Personally, I think that is going to arrive faster than we are actually prolonging our bodies. Saying that, it's a huge industry. There are so many people working on it because it's, uh, of course, the most wealthy in the world who has the money to invest on um, adding on years to their lifespan. And then it's not just about living longer, I guess it's also living better. Um, you can take all these medications right now. You can take ice cold baths and you can do fasting 16 hours a day and just eating for eight hours a day. There are many things. But for me, I think it's much more important that we start planning uh, the broader society. I think uh, spending time on deciding how long you should live yourself and spending all your energy along that line is taking energy away from finding out what sort of society we do we want to give our ancestors. So our great-grandchildren, when they look back, will they say, oh, I'm so happy that JC and Lisa Lotte was there because they actually started posing some really critical questions to society that we could reflect about or say, oh, they spent, you know, the last 10 years of their life trying to become two years older, <laughs> you know. They have a saying, life happens when you're busy making plans. So while if you're always in the planning mode, you're not in the moment experiencing what's happening, whether it's a beautiful sunset or a conversation that you're having with a friend, which brings me to trends. What are some of the trends that you can share that you see happening in the next five to 10 years that people can explore or be interested in talking about? So quantum computing is interesting because that is what we need in order to understand the pattern in all this data that we are collecting. As I said before, the precision society, really understanding that you shouldn't think about yourself as an individual any longer. You should think about yourself as a village and a, a virtual village and a physical village and how you want to bring that around you. The whole trend of some people are becoming more and more pacified and more and more binging while they look at other people doing hobbies and other people are actually not just watching how to bake a cake, but they actually go into the kitchen and bake their own cake. And I think it's really important to, to look into that trend of, of becoming an active citizen who is actually contributing, whether it's a coworker or as a citizen, how can you influence society and looking at uh, some of these uh, democratizing forces. And yes, it's true that we have some tech giants, but we also have a lot of room to, to make out our own playing fields at the moment. Uh, we're not forced to, to follow the, the path that are laid out for us. That's something that you need to practice. 
Then we have uh, these people who are getting older and older who need to uh, live many different careers and many different types of lives. And there I think it's really good to train being a beginner. So think with yourself, how can I be a beginner many times? And when did I last do something for the first time? And try to challenge yourself because if you can do it one place, you can do it in other places as well. Hopefully we're looking into a much more playful future. And I think one very important takeaway is that you cannot catch the future on your own. You need somebody to have your back. It's like going diving in the ocean. You know, you would never go down the ocean on your own. You always need a body on your side to check each other's oxygen. It's exactly the same thing going into the future. You need somebody who can dare you to be a beginner, dare you to pose the difficult questions. Oh, another very important trend, I think, is that we're moving from answers to that it's all about posing the interesting questions. So, it's if you can program anything from telling the computer to do it, well, you need to pose the interesting question, what should I ask it to program, you know? So, so and if you have the neural link from Elon Musk, where you are wired up on uh, Google, you can get any answer you like, but the point is not the answer, it's can you actually ask, the most important question that is transformative for you and society and that's a tricky part so we are moving away from a society of answers to being able to discuss philosophy arts and we are moving into a rehumanized society where we are having to listen to ourselves again when are we lazy when do we not want to do something anymore when are we upset? How is our ethical, moral compass? When we talk so much about artificial intelligence, it will only continue the patterns that we are laying out in society. So if we are laying out a very biased society, which is very polluting, we're just going to get more of the same. So again, post important questions of what sort of society we want to create. And that will be very important because... As I said, we can get anything we want. So be careful for what you dream of. Wow, that's well said. I'm very excited about the future and the age of Aquarius. And I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Is there any other thing that you would like to share? When you say age of Aquarius and you think, oh, I have to talk to Lisa Lotta, this uh, Danish futurist. So what did you think about, you know, contacting me? Maybe we should try and, and draw a link to, to Aquarius age. So uh, is it about a new human spirituality, a new interdependence, connectivity? Can you put some... Yeah, I think for Age of Aquarius, for me, I... I am an astrologer, but I also work in cybersecurity. I work in tech. I have the opportunity to work with some really brilliant people on a daily basis. And the pandemic, I think, gave all of us a lot of time to think and be more reflective and self-aware. So the age of Aquarius to me is about raising consciousness, raising the vibration. I think information is power, expanding your knowledge. I really like what you said about do something that you've never done before. A lot of us spend a lot of time like, oh, I would love to learn how to ski or oh, I'm a terrible cook. I want to learn how to cook. That now taking the time to learn something new and different. Virtually, I've challenged myself now, like you have meetups all over the world. And so I'm like, okay, I've joined a futurist group in London. I would never be able to meet with them physically in person, but virtually I can meet with them on a weekly basis. And so that really expands the conversation of, of something that I'm interested in. So the age of Aquarius is about thinking differently, being open-minded, being independent, and really thinking about the possibilities in the world. I don't know if you know, but I'm in, in NISA, this Europol group, trying to make foresight in terms of where will the next cyber attack come from. As you know, there has been a foredoubling of cyber attack during the pandemic. And it's really interesting to see, you know, because if we have to survive two months without electricity and Wi-Fi, you know, who can actually produce something? That will be a proper crisis because compared to, to this pandemic, it will be nothing, you know. I am very curious because 
So I'm, I'm going at it as a futurist. And at the same time, I'm working for this big insurance company. And uh, I had to go through a clearance of my security. And they sent me 200 questions that I had to answer. And I didn't understand these questions. And, you know, I, I used to study economics and politics in Oxford. And I didn't understand the questions. I had to hire an IT guy to answer these security questions. And these guys at uh, Liberty, this insurance company, they had a guy hired to fix this security issue. So right now they're living in this little bubble, these uh, cyber security guys. And I'm like, can they even protect us? And when they speak a language that I don't understand, can I help them getting better? I'm very curious on, on your thoughts on that because I'm really looking at that as a, I don't know, some, some almost like a cancer in society right now because it's so... Uh, hard to penetrate and the good old military they won't be able to fix this the police won't be able to fix it the only one you can send after it is people who are doing cyber crimes themselves i think it's it's such a dilemma how do you how do you envision that we as citizens should be able to do anything about this I have a friend of mine, he's a police officer, he's a detective. And because I work in cybersecurity during the day, it's very easy for me to find somebody within like 15 minutes. Using online resources, whether it's social media and databases. And he was even amazed how quickly I could find people within 15 minutes or if it's a criminal looking up their records. And it's knowing where the information is. And that's where these hackers and people that are stealing information, they are experts in finding information. And I think people give out their information on social media too easily. And then they're sharing their information with their children. So if you don't know something about a particular person, but you know their sister's name or their their children's name, you can find people and it's easy to connect them. So I think there's still a human element to cybersecurity and data hacking. People aren't very good about creating passwords. Passwords like this is the number one. Change your password on a monthly basis. Make it difficult. Don't choose the same password for your banking, for your social media. Those are simple things. But for example, when Twitter was hacked and they hacked into all those high profile celebrities, they were three teenagers in high school. It was just basic someone, I believe if I remember correctly, Someone on the administrative side of Twitter used a password. It was a password that was really easy to hack. It's just simple human error. And naturally, if you're a cyber attacker, you're going to go after what's going to affect people the most. So if it's like taking out the electricity or taking out the airline software. So now all of a sudden you have to cancel flights for three days or, oh, now we don't have gasoline. And part of, in my experience, cyber hackers, part of it is bragging rights. They just want to see if they can do it. A lot of them are very young. You're very correct in saying there's like a bubble that people live in and you have to add the human aspect of it because at the end of the day, they're just a person. And if I'm in charge of, of administration at a big company, you know, we all make mistakes. And so I think having backup people to double check what other people are doing will help, help protect. So what they do right now is that they are trying to make fake attacks, you know, so people practice. That's one thing. And the states have just come out. I think Biden has come out saying, well, if you attack any organization in the U.S. will come after you, we will find you, we will hunt you down. So I'm like, oh, no, then they will choose Denmark instead, you know, because, again, we will have this competition between state powers. So these criminals will go to wherever the weakest spot is, more or less, uh, to, to ask for these ransomware, right? So, um, well, it's going to be very interesting. That and, of course, uh, warfare. This is a huge area within future studies as well, which is horrible and terrible, but technology is neutral. You can use it for good and you can use it for bad, right? Yes, yes. And I just think in the age of Aquarius, knowledge is power. And the, the person that's sitting at home could be a housewife, could become a brilliant cybersecurity expert or become a biohacker or a student. I've like, even with biohacking, people are learning how to do it online 
And so you don't necessarily have to go to a university, but you have to have a passion to learn how to to do something. And sometimes coders can become experts over a person that might have a, a PhD because they have the passion and they're practicing it on a daily basis. So, so in that sense, you know, decentralization of knowledge. So we all have the knowledge at our finger pits and then the empowerment of people. So they're actually being able to, to grab onto that. That's probably the most important trend. Uh, so the decentralization of knowledge and that we are all able to access programming and, and coding and what have you. That should improve society somewhat, making us all richer. Because I think the, the other trend is really then we just uh, walk around uh, picking our own belly button, you know. Because as society get more and more complex, you can't see how you fit in. You hear the robots are coming. I'm losing my job. I don't know how I can contribute the value in society. And then you, your focus become extremely narrow-minded. So I think... In that sense, the Aquarius time is so important if we have this enlightenment feeling. That's really powerful. And that's exactly why I said yes to participate today as well. I'm so happy that you did. A lot of the information you shared today is so fascinating. And, and I think the listeners are really going to hopefully take your advice and go try something new for the first time. And from from me, go change your password <laughs> and change yeah, it on a regular yeah. basis. Protect <laughs> exactly. yourself. Well, thank you so much. And is there a website that you can recommend where someone can find you? You can uh, go to futurenavigator.com. I have an online course in Future Studies. And if you like to meet other people physically, I have physical courses as well in Copenhagen. If we can travel again at some point. But I think it's a great competence that anybody can learn. So it's not looking into a crystal ball. It's actually a method that you can learn and apply to create a better decision making. And otherwise, you know, ask me anything. As I said, we are moving into an area where era where where questions are more important than answers. But still you can find me on LinkedIn. I'll put in a link to the article on uh, lasting changes of the pandemic. That's in English at least, JC. So well, everyone check our show notes when the podcast airs and we'll put links to your website and also the article you recommended. And thank you again, Lisa. It has been wonderful talking with you. Wonderful meeting you. Bye. Bye. You just heard the Age of Aquarius podcast with your host, JC Nova. Remember to subscribe to the show on your favorite streaming platform. Thanks for tuning in. Age of Aquarius is a Cosmic Media production and recorded in Los Angeles, California. A special thanks to our producers, Georgie Rutherford and Christopher Lang. To learn more about Age of Aquarius, please visit our website at ageofaquarius.fm. Thanks for listening. Yeah.